may be seated. Or go back to laying down if you're at home. <laughs> um, so I want to read uh, a scripture today. I want to read out of Luke. I um, want to read Luke 9, verses 51 through 58. And just want to give a little bit of a backstory before we really get into it. I'm going to make some inferences, and, and, and please um, bear with me, and I'll definitely do my best to separate what's actually written in the Word and what Randy kind of thinks. Um, but really, what's happening right now is the Lord Jesus Christ, he, he's preparing to go on a journey. Um, this last road trip or this journey is going to take him from Galilee to Jerusalem, where he's going to pay the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. So I can only imagine during that time frame, he knows what the end is going to be. But that road that's, that he has to travel to get there is going to go through towns, uh, Samaritan towns, where we know the Samaritans and the Jews had beef, right? So not only is his final destination death, but that road traveled is going to be challenging for him. That road challenging is not going to be the easiest. He's not going to be welcomed. So let us read. Um, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And again, you know, in order for God in his perfect ways to truly understand and recognize us as humans and people, he had to put on a robe of flesh. And when he put on that robe of flesh, he not only put on the skin, but he put on all the feelings, all the emotions, everything that comes with being a person, everything that comes with wearing that robe, of that robe of flesh. And we know he had feelings, right? We know when his friend Lazarus died, he was sad. Uh, we know in the Garden of Gethsemane, I mean, before he was to be crucified, he prayed so hard and he was anguished that he sweat blood. So we know he had these feelings. So when I, when I see um, he set his face, in other translations means that um, he made up his mind. He was, he was going to persevere through it. He built up his courage, not to say that he was fearful of anything, but again, just understanding those human emotions that he was possibly going through at that time. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set forward towards Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? I mean, he's, wrong with, he's got the right people on a road trip with him for sure. Uh, and, and that shows how mighty and how powerful he is. But again, he knew what he had to do. He knew the road that he was traveling. Didn't make it any easier, but again, just that human element, that emotion, that protection. You know, I'm sure he had to be feeling it and definitely his disciples were definitely feeling it. But he turned and rebuked them and they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the, and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. And, and I think what the Lord was really telling him and telling the rest of us and just really assuring himself that when you sign up for this mission right here, it's not going to be all crowds giving you praise of worship. There's going to be uncertainty. There's going to be challenges. People are going to turn you away. And can you imagine the Lord Jesus Christ has no place to lay his head? I mean, just imagine those thoughts, those feelings that he had to be going through during that time. Um, you know, and, and, and again, I, I can't help to think that, you know, man said he may have been a little bit anxious. Who wouldn't be anxious, again, knowing what they had to do to pay that ultimate sacrifice? So as we continue going our series, going deeper, recognizing anxiety, when I think back to January and when we first started the series with our 2020 vision, um, as we moved on to relationships, going deeper in our relationships, as we looked at our calling, there's been one constant throughout that. There's been one thing that's kind of stopped us, one thing that's been working to impede us. And that's been anxiety. And, you know, if I can kind of share a story with you real quick about me. You know, I went through a terrible bout with anxiety about a month ago. Um, it shut me down. It crippled me. But when I think back, this started years ago. Um, you know, as you guys know, if you don't know, I played professional football back in the 90s. And it was the thing I had dreamed about doing all my life. 
but it was the thing at that time I didn't realize that caused the most anxiety in my life. One thing about the NFL stands for the National Football League, but it also stands for not for long. The most cutthroat business that you could be in. And it's one of those places where no matter how well you do, you can't control your future. You can't control your fate. Being the 53rd man on a 53-man team, going into work each morning was wondering if work was going to be there. Right? So no matter how well I was playing, could have been playing the best ball in my life, could have been doing everything that was asked of me, but if number 22 on that, on that roster got hurt or injured, they didn't let him go. They brought someone in to fill his role in number 53. They say, see you later. And how they do it is so crazy. Um, they, don't, they don't even let you make it to the building. So as you're driving up, there'll be a guy waiting at the door with a plastic bag in the parking lot. Say, hey, you got your playbook? Coach needs to see you. And that brought so much fear, so much terror in my heart, wondering each day as I went to work, was I going to have a job? And I didn't recognize it then. You know, as I woke up in the morning, it felt like an elephant was on my chest. And that elephant got heavier and heavier and heavier the closer and the closer that I got to work. And that, that, that elephant didn't jump off until I actually made it to the parking lot, that I made it through the lobby, and I got to my locker. I was like, OK, my helmet's still there. My pads are still there. My playbook is still here. I'm good for today. And, and then the anxiety didn't go away. It just became a distraction. And, and back then, I knew how to, had other things that occupied my time, right? I was playing the game, had friends, didn't have really a family that much. And, and my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, always used to wonder, why don't you ever talk about football? Why don't you ever let me help you? What, what's going on? I didn't want anything to do with it because just that mention of football put that elephant back on my chest. And I didn't realize then that that was anxiety. You know, I kind of recognize it, but here I'm a big, strong football player. Shouldn't be suffering from anxiety. What, what is that? You know, tough it out. Tough, just like you would tough anything else out. And that's the absolutely wrong way to go about it. Fast forward to about a month ago, um, in, in my past role, I'm at work. I knew it, it was my time. It was time for a change. Loved the people I worked with. Loved everything that I was doing, but it just was time. It, it wasn't I was wanting to get out. It wasn't any one bad thing that, would, that happened. So knowing at the times that we were in, knowing this, the uncertainty that we we're facing, kind of changed my prayer from, Lord, protect my job, you know, to, Lord, just protect our income. Yeah. Because it, it was time to go. Yeah. And really, within 72 hours, get a phone call you know, from, my, from my supervisor saying, hey, it's one of those tough conversations. You know, your position's been eliminated. And you don't understand the release, the joy that it felt, because the next words out of her mouth was, but there's a new role for you. You're going to be able to keep your benefits. You're going to be able to keep your salary. All of those things will stay the same. So I knew it was the Lord, right? So I knew he had his hand on everything. It's just what I asked for, and it just gave me so much joy. Fast forward two days later, I get another phone call, and she says, hey, you know what? You're going to be considered for a promotion. Yes. You're going to have a 1,000 people reporting to you. You're going to be able to work from home. All these things, the increase, asked for it, knew the Lord had his hand on it. Everything was great. Everything was rocking and rolling until about three days in. You know, at work, and I'm sure many of you have heard the expression before in the past, if I'm the smartest person in the room, then I'm in the wrong room. But let me tell you, when you feel like you're the dumbest person in the room, <laughs> you don't want to be in that room either. And that's what it felt like for those first couple of days, right? Not so much that anything was going wrong, except for that battle between my two ears, right? Just trying to get out of my own mind, getting out of my own way. And guess what came back? That old elephant. Except this time, that elephant brought his friend. You know, so each day it felt like two elephants were sitting on my chest. And be, be, because of the times that we live in right now, home was work, yeah. home was home, yeah. home was gym, home is the restaurant, yeah. home was the social club, home was everything. Yeah. And there was that chair in my office that the only time the elephant would jump off my chest 
is when I sat in that chair. And I sat in that chair hours upon hours upon hours just so that anxiety would go away. You know, it, it got so bad where I wasn't eating, wasn't drinking anything, wasn't getting out to see the family, wasn't shaving. You know, it, it was just, it was just a, a very, it was a rough time. It was a, it was a rough stretch until I had to really recognize that anxiety is real. Yes. You know, it, it, it's no joke. Um, it, it's tough. You know, anxiety can come in a form, it can be a spiritual challenge, right? And what I want to talk about with that spiritual challenge is that there's obsessive doubt, right? It's, it's not those things that are truly threats, right? It may be someone that may have hurt us in the past that where we can't trust. It may be something that went on with folks where we just haven't gotten over it, where we haven't forgiven, right? Those are the spiritual challenges where we really obsess in what happens there. But it can also be a mental health challenge, right? And that's real. Um, again, folks in my family have it, should have recognized it, right? But it's something that's taboo. It's, it's, it's a shame that if my arm was broken, my leg was broken, I can ask for help. Someone would definitely offer to help me because physically there's something going on. But mentally, I look like you look. I'm functioning, appear to function like you function every day, but mentally, it's just not, it's just not working, right? So anxiety is real, it comes in a mental challenge. And again, I want everyone to know, it's not just you, and it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's nothing to be fearful of, it's not taboo. You know, 40 million Americans suffer from anxiety. You know, it's the number one cause of mental health in the United States. So you're not alone. Yeah. It's not only you. Uh, but you can overcome it. You definitely can overcome this challenge. But it's, it's going to take time, right? It's going to take time. And we're going to have to use all of the tools that we started learning way back in January, what you're calling, building those relationships, walking things out, cutting through the weeds, going through the pressure, so we can really work to overcome these challenges, right? Because God doesn't want us to suffer from anxiety. We're going to read out of Psalms, 9, excuse, Psalms 94, 18 through 19. And it reads, When I said my foot is slipping, your unfailing love, Lord, supported me. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. So, you know, when we, when we look at the psalmist, it says, When my foot is slipping, when I'm losing my grip, when I'm losing control, when things are getting away from me. It doesn't say if, right? It says when. We talked about that road that we have to travel. The unfailing love supported me, right? But then it says when anxiety is great within me. It doesn't say if anxiety comes. It doesn't say you'll never experience. It says when anxiety is great in me. That means we're going to have to deal with it, right? And some can, some can handle better than others, right? But the number one thing it says, your consolation brought me joy. Seeking the Lord, right? The Lord doesn't want us to suffer from anxiety. Yeah. The Lord also doesn't want us to worry. In James 4, 13 through 14 says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there, and trade and make a profit. So let's just kind of change that to what we're going through today. You're going to say, you know what? Tomorrow I'm going to go out to the store. And I'm going to go do this and that. Right? But unfortunately for us, when we get stuck between our own ears, it's never anything that we're thinking about good. Yeah. At least this person right here thought good enough to like, we're going to go to this town and make a profit. For me, it's like, oh my God, I got to go to work tomorrow and I got to talk in front of people. They're not going to hear my message. Right? They're not going to understand me. We, we think of a thousand different things and 999 of them are negative. Yeah. It's absolutely crazy. Even when we know what the Lord has in store for us, right? Even though, even though we know that the Lord is not going to leave us, he's not going to forsake us, right? Even though we know the Lord doesn't want us to suffer. Even though we know the Lord doesn't want us to worry, right? We're still making these plans without him first. But he says, yet... You do not know what tomorrow will bring. Right. It's good. 
We're having all these thoughts in our heads, consuming ourselves with all these outcomes, 999 of them negative. And we don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't even know if that town is going to be there. We don't even know if we're going to be able to travel. We don't know if that meeting at work is, is going to happen. We don't know who's going to receive that. But yet and still, we're worrying about all of these things. We're worried about walking to the store because that next person over there, that person may have COVID and I may get it and I can't go here and I can't go there. All of the things that we're worrying about between our ears, but we don't know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. I mean, think about it. God's time isn't our time. He's letting us know right now, your days are numbered. I'm the author and the finisher. Yeah. What are you worried about? Why are you creating these scenarios in your head when I control what happens? I ordain what goes on in your life. You only have a little bit of time here. Straighten up, get it right. Enjoy that time. Get out of your own head, right? He doesn't want us to have to worry. Yeah. And then after that time, we're gone. Right? And just think about some of the situations that we've been in when we thought about these scenarios and we worried about it and, and we planned and, and, and it didn't happen. So think about all of that wasted time yeah. worrying about something that never came to fruition. And we missed the moment. Yeah. Right? We missed being able to live in that moment of, oh my gosh, someone actually asked me to come speak in front of my group of peers. What a great honor. Yeah. Right? We missed that moment. Someone asked me to get in front of all levels of the organization. We missed that moment. We're worrying about it. We have missed that honor. You know, there's so many things in our lives where we just worry about that outcome. We worry about things that may never happen that we forget about this very moment. We forget about being right here, right now. Think about our relationships where we're worried about, man, if I say this or if I say that, you know, my wife's going to get upset or may upset my kids. Or, I'm not going to do this and I'm not going to do that worry and we miss the moment and that's not what the Lord wants for us the Lord also doesn't want us to live in fear Joshua 1 9 says have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous he didn't say I didn't ask you he didn't say I hope you're strong and courageous he didn't say, hey, if you get a moment, be strong and courageous. I commanded you. Yeah. Yeah. The creator of the heavens and the universe commanded us to be strong and to be courageous. So how dare us not, right? Yeah. But it's a challenge, right? That, that anxiety is real. And he knows that it's real. You know, for me, the toughest part of my day in that new role was this, this 9 o'clock in the morning meeting I had. It had gotten so bad that I had to ask my wife, hey, please just come in here, be with me. Just, just come sit in this room as I go through this meeting. Because I wasn't being strong, I wasn't being courageous. You know, I was being fearful. And again, I wanna make it clear, we know that anxiety is a mental health challenge. So by no stretch of the imagination, am I saying that anyone that is suffering from anxiety is not strong and is not courageous? where the strength and the courage comes from is to live in the moment, to get to that step and to be courageous enough to speak, to be courageous enough to do what you were called to do, to be courageous enough to do what you were asked to do. And I wasn't. And first couple of meetings, my wife said to me, I don't know who that was talking, that's not my husband. It doesn't sound like you. And for me, the one thing that I'm pretty sure I can do is communicate. Yeah. Yes, sir. It is to get my point across so people can kind of understand it in a way that they can take it in. And I wasn't even acting in one of the gifts that God gave me wow. just because it was so much, so much anxiety. Yeah. So much had built up in me and it was paralyzing. I couldn't think. I couldn't talk straight. I couldn't formulate my ideas. And I just didn't want to be there. Got so much to the point where I was fearful to be alone in my office. I had to have my wife ask her, hey, please, I don't know what you got going on today in your day, but just be with me, just so I can get through. But the Lord said, have I not commanded you? Be strong, be courageous, 
do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Wherever you go. And that's that mental health challenge with it. I knew the Lord had ordained this move, right? I asked him, protect my finances. Couple of days later, changes. Didn't ask about any other roles, anything else. Another phone call says, hey, you're going to get this new role. You're going to get a promotion. You're going to move on. I know that the Lord had his hand on these things, yeah. right? That's good, Neil. Yeah. But it's just that road that we have to travel, yeah. that uncertainty. And I'm here to tell you, sometimes emotions, they suck, right? They really, really do because we know better, yeah. right? We know in our minds and our hearts that what, what the outcome is. Jesus didn't bring us this far along just to drop us off at the side of the road. Yeah. That's not what he has meant for us, but it's those emotions that interfere with what the Lord has commanded us to do, not asked us to do. These, these emotions can be great at certain times. We can feel the joy. We can feel happiness. We can feel elation. But man, when we get stuck between here, yeah. I don't understand nothing good ever comes out of it. We're the worst of the worst. We're not good enough. We're not smart enough. We're less than, we're not this, we're not that, we can't move forward, all of these things, for things that we've done for so long, for things that we know that the Lord has ordained, the gifts that he's given us, we get stuck between here because of emotions. He doesn't want us to live in that fear. We've got to be able to just to take that step forward and get beyond it and lean on the promises that God has made for us. The Lord also doesn't want us to give up. Isaiah 41.10 says, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I mean, look at that. He's with us. He reconfirms that he's our God. He's going to strengthen us. He's going to help us. He's going to uphold us. These are the promises that we know to be true. These are the promises that we know are real. He's never broken a promise. He hasn't. We've just got to be able to fight through. And one thing that really stuck with me um, a couple sermons ago when, when Pastor was talking about pressure, right? How we have to be able to go through that pressure and we have to see it through. I kind of equated that to being a bag of microwave popcorn, you know, and, and God is going to pop us. Right? I mean, just think about it. If you've ever popped popcorn, microwave popcorn before, you've got to get the settings just right. And imagine that we're the whole bag and all of our talents, all of our gifts, all of our blessings, they're the kernels. Mm -hmm. We know when the Lord puts us in that microwave and he sets that timer, mm -hmm. if we ask to get out too soon, mm -hmm. we're only going to get a half pop bag of popcorn. Right. We're not going to be totally developed. And if we don't see it through, if you've ever tried to put popcorn back in the microwave and repop it, you end up damaging what was already established. Yeah, that's good. So the Lord knows, he has his hand on us. Yeah. You know, he knows when we get into that heat, he's gonna be with us, right? He's our God, he's gonna strengthen us, he's gonna help us, he's not gonna keep us in there too long so we don't burn, right? He knows just the amount of time to get a fully developed bag of popcorn, right? So that's, again, we can't ask to get out too soon. We have to have that trust, right? We have to be able to welcome that pressure because it's for our good, ultimately. So the Lord wants us to be free. He doesn't want us to be tied down by these feelings of anxiety. He doesn't want us to be tied down by fear. He wants us to be free from anxiety. So how do we free ourselves from anxiety? The first thing we have to do is acknowledge it. Now, I've never been an alcoholic, but I definitely know it. one of the first steps in that 12-step program is God admit that you have a problem, right? Same thing with anxiety. The first step is we got to acknowledge it. We can't hide from it. It's nothing to be shameful of. It's nothing to be embarrassed about. Because how can we ever seek the Lord's help? How can we ever seek the help of others if we first don't acknowledge and recognize that we have a challenge, right? That we have a problem. There's nothing wrong with it. I suffer from anxiety. 
And each and every time that I say it, it's a level of freedom. Because now that's one less thing that I have to keep trapped inside of my chest so I can get this elephant off of my chest. And it's freeing. And then when you mention it, oh my gosh, you don't realize how much support that's around you. How many other people may have experienced what you've experienced? How many other people have gone through what you've gone through? Again, it got so bad, I, re I remember one day before prayer, I asked Pastor, hey, after this prayer, I need to talk to you. Just because it had consumed me. I had kept it in for so long, I couldn't move. I couldn't do anything. But just that acknowledgement, just that release, being able to talk to him, and he shared some of his experiences as well. He says, you know what, I know right where you are. And that was comforting. You know, but again, just acknowledging it, just, just knowing that we're out there, we have people ready to support us. You know, like I mentioned before, we get a sprained ankle, broken hand, something goes on to us, to us physically, everybody's around to support, right? Those same people that will support you through those physical challenges are the same people that will support you through these mental challenges, right? Through this anxiety. But you just got to let them know, hey, I'm here. Here's where I am. I need your help. So we've got to acknowledge it. The second thing we need to do is we need to, think, we need to seek counsel. And I think we need to seek counsel in a couple of forms, right? First and foremost, you know, the one thing I'll say, we are all blessed to be in this church. Um, and for you folks that are just visiting, let me tell you, we have the best pastor that the Lord can provide to any church. Yeah. To any church. Just try him. Start there. He truly, truly means it. Again, he's traveling today because someone tried him, and he's there answering that call. And he's answered that call for all of us. So if, if you're having these challenges, start there. You know, and trust me, he will be available. But for some reason, if he's not, we've got a great group of ministers. Yeah. They'll be there for you. Yeah. A group of folks that are not judgmental, a group of folks that they don't care, they don't care about history, they don't care about anything except you. They just want to see whatever it is that, that they can help you with, how can they support, how can they help. Yeah. Our deacons, our stewards, every church member. This, this is an amazing group of people that it's a support system. So seek counsel from godly people first. You know, also seek counsel from your loved ones, from your spouses. Um, you know, it, it's just an amazing thing. Um, you know, I've watched my wife over the years counsel other folks. I've watched her help other people through certain situations. But it took me to be down seven pounds with a scruffy beard and not eating to finally say, hey, can you help me? And it was amazing. And I think she was a little bit shocked too. She's like, you seem surprised that I was able to help you. I'm like, nah, I wasn't surprised that you could help. I knew that. It, it, it's just the situation was just so tough that it was surprising that it took me this long to raise my hand and to say help. So she sat down with me. We, we came up with some plans, some strategies, some techniques that I'm still using today. Because again, we talked about in the beginning, we can overcome it, but it's going to take some time. So these are the same strategies, the same support system that we're still using. And then also, too, you might need to seek help from a professional. And there's nothing wrong with that. Think about it. All these years, we pay, we've been paying for all this money for our health care, right? But we rarely use it, right? One, one of the biggest challenges in our community is we like to have it, but man, if I go to the doctor, they're going to find something wrong with me. No, there was already something wrong with you in the beginning. <laughs> you just went to the doctor and he confirmed the fact, right? So we've got to seek counsel, even from a professional. Um, that's what they're there for, yeah. you know. But the one thing is you need to make sure that their beliefs line up with your beliefs. Right. If their beliefs don't line up with your beliefs, run, go find somebody else, right? Because the Lord gave them the power to create that medicine. The Lord gave them the knowledge to prescribe treatments. If they don't recognize that their talents, their abilities came from the Lord, go find someone else. But it's okay. You know, it, it's not, you won't be less than if you seek counsel. 
is actually a level of vulnerability. And from vulnerability, there comes courage. There comes growth. So seek that counsel. Seek that help. One person by themselves is not going to be able to get you through it. And again, from my own situation, I've been dealing with it for years. And I've been able to suppress it. But I haven't been able to start to make gains to put it behind me until I acknowledge it first and then until I begin to seek counsel. Amen. The next thing is live in the present. The only thing that we have control over is right now. I can't do anything about yesterday. I can't do anything about an hour from now, a day from now, a week from now. The only thing that I can control or impact is the present. Right? So again, we get these scenarios in our head. We start worrying about these future things that may or may not ever happen. And those things, again, that elephant jumps back on our chest, right? We got to be able to pray to just stay in the moment. You know, one of the things that's really helped me when I felt that elephant jump on me, dear Lord, just let me stay right here, right now. I can't have that conversation right now, right? I can't do that presentation right now. I can't put that report together right now. So please just let me sleep, right? Stay in the present. Can't be worried about, again, if I go out to the store, what's going to happen, right? Can't stay in the house all the time. We got to have some, some faith in the Lord, right? Some trust in the Lord. He's kept us safe this long, right? Yeah. We continue to do the right things. So let's just have that faith, but let's live in the present. There's also an old saying that you know, I heard a, a while ago that I really like. Um, you know, can't do anything about the past. That's why they call it the past. Can't do anything about tomorrow. That's the future. But they call the present a reason because it's a gift. Yeah. Enjoy it. Accept it as a present. Right, yeah. So let's stay in the moment. Let's not miss those moments. Let's stay right here, right now. Let's not worry about those things that are beyond our control. Right? Because how much control do we really have anyway? Right? Again, the Lord is the author and the finisher. Yeah. He's the one that, that, that knows every hair on our head. Yeah. Right? He counts. He plans our steps. So let's get back into enjoying that moment. And in that moment, let's reach out to the Lord in prayer. Right? You know, after that, we have to go deeper in our relationships. Again, we, we've been sometimes scratching the surface, or we have so many people around us that are so talented that we haven't tried them. Again, I talked about my wife. Been living with her for over 20 years, two decades, right? And I see that she's talented, and I know I was having this problem way back before we were married. And she would always offer, let's talk about it. Let's get through it. Nah, I, I didn't want to... I wanted to keep it right at that surface level. I didn't want to go deeper in that relationship because in order for me to go deeper in that relationship, I would have first had to acknowledge I had a problem. And I didn't want to acknowledge that I had that problem, right? I would have had to be vulnerable to talk about a weakness. And again, I, I, I'm this big, strong man. How can I be weak here? How can you help me, right? So we have to be able to go deeper in our relationships. We have to be able to go deeper in our relationships with the Lord as well, too. We have to be able to push past that surface level, right? So many things, we, we're, we're cool at keeping things status quo. We're creatures of habit. We don't like change. But I'm here to tell you that the only way that we're going to get through this anxiety is through deeper relationships. And, and one thing that definitely helps, no doubt, is prayer, yeah. right? You know, and, and it's different, you know. Prayer for anxiety, it's going to be a constant battle. It's going to be a constant challenge. Praying more than once in this occasion doesn't show a lack of faith in the Lord. Let me tell you what it does. Now, I'm not a biology major, but I do know that our nerves, our senses, can only feel one sensation at a time. So, that, that, so if you're hurting and someone rubs that area that's hurting, it doesn't make the pain go away. It just causes conflicting senses, right? So the nerves can't process that, so it makes the pain go away, right? So you can't feel hot and cold at the same time, right? Because two different senses, two different feelings. So when you're feeling that elephant on your chest, 
Pray to the Lord. Invite that joy into your heart so that elephant can get off your chest. And you may have to do it 20 times in 20 minutes just to keep that elephant off your chest. But how bad do you want the elephant off your chest? How bad do you want to overcome this anxiety? Form that stronger and closer relationship with the Lord through constant prayer, through constant prayer. Because when the Lord fills our heart with joy and his love, there's nothing else that can come in its place. It's when we let our guard down, right, that we start getting back in here instead of down on these knees and here to have him fill our hearts. So it has to be constant. It has to be, we have to get disciplined to do that. Again, it doesn't have to be a 40-minute prayer. Just long enough so you can feel the Spirit of the Lord in your heart and you can feel that elephant walk away. And the more and more we go deeper in those relationships, the more and more that we seek counsel from other folks, the more and more that we let other people in, we're building those relationships. You know, the more that we can see, man, I didn't realize you had this particular talent. Let's go deeper. You know, I didn't realize that you were suffering with that. Let's talk about it together. There's healing in that. Yeah. There are bonds that are formed in that. And now where are we? Two or three are gathered in the presence of the Lord. Now we're worshiping. So now we're together worshiping. We're building our relationship together, and we're building a stronger foundational relationship with the Lord. That's the most important thing. That's how we start to free ourselves from anxiety. Going deeper. Going deeper. We've got to cut through, you know, worrying about how I'm going to be perceived. How are people going to think about me, right? That's that road that's traveled. That's what the Lord mentioned when he said, Son of man doesn't have a place to lay his head. That's their trip from Galilee to Jerusalem. We know in the end the Lord's got us. We know he's going to take care of us. We know his promises. We know he's never going to leave us, never forsake us. But we've got to gird up. We've got to lock arms. We've got to go deeper in our relationships to get that support from each other so we can make it through. And the last thing is we need to embrace uncertainty. And if we go back, uh, can we hit that next slide too? Real quick, I'm sorry. So we need to embrace certainty. And Luke 9, 5, 8 says, And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Through uncertainty, you allow the Lord to do some of his greatest work. Some of the greatest miracles happen. On this journey from Galilee to Jerusalem, through the uncertainty of going through these Samaritan villages, through the uncertainty of not having a place to sleep, through the uncertainty of man, Lord, would you take, you know, must I have this cup? Do I have to really go and die? The greatest miracle happened. Through that uncertainty, the Lord was nailed to that cross. And he died for all of our sins so that we can be free of sin through uncertainty. But it doesn't stop there. Three days later, he got up again. So we don't have to ever taste death so just think about it. It started with a road trip. Mm-hmm. It started with a journey. And along the way of, of that journey, there were crowds in some places. He wasn't accepted in other places. He wasn't welcome. He didn't have a place to sleep. But he embraced that. He knew what those promises were. And he shared with us, going to be some trials. There are going to be some tribulations. There are going to be some people that won't accept you. There's going to be some people that think you're less than. We're going to experience all of those, but we have to stay the course. Because, again, in those times, we allow the Lord to show himself the strongest. So this week, what I'd like you to do, when I have feelings of fear, anxiety, or separation, I will recite our uplift, confirmation. Amen. To God be the glory. Amen.